I think it might be hard if the child doesn't get the tools Mm -hmm. that he or she needs to move forward. It's a little bit of a disability, but I think if there's a way to give that child acceptance, it's their superpower. They're creative and hardworking. And I think it's important for us to help educate the teachers and parents as to what to look for. Hello and welcome to the Dyslexia Mom Boss Podcast, the show that helps you not only feel empowered and knowledgeable, but confident and a boss mom in the dyslexia journey. I'm your host, Dr. Lauren. All right, we are still in season four of the Dyslexia Mom Boss podcast. I am really excited to introduce, so this is a mother and son, and they are going to be talking about a children's book. So those of you who have been following my work, you know that it's just amazing to have representation in text. And I know that was another episode that I did a while ago with my friend Hannah, but I just think it is so imperative for kids to see a reflection of them in literature. And so we're going to delve into that today. So I have Lynn and John, and they are here on the show. So welcome, Lynn and John. How are you guys? Great. Happy to be here. We're really excited to talk to you about our book. Yes. And we are really excited to hear about it. And this season is all about international talks and storytelling. So I know that we're going to delve into dyslexia personally and what that looked like and the inspiration behind this book. But before we do that, I really would love if you all could introduce yourselves Talk about the context of what dyslexia is to you and why you're here. Sure. My name is Jonathan. I have dyslexia. I was diagnosed when I was younger, and I am now remediated. Though during my time there with dyslexia, I found that art was perhaps the best way for me to communicate. Mm -hmm. So I would often find myself drawing and doodling pretty much any surface I could find, including a wall or two. So now we decided, why don't we put this forward with uh, the book? And so I illustrated it. I'm Lynn, I'm John's mom, and John is my youngest of four. So I knew when he was young that he was super smart, but also something was up because he was not able to do the ABCs. Mm-hmm. And I was committed to figuring out what it was. And when he was diagnosed with dyslexia, we decided to try to move forward and see the best way to remediate him so that he could read. And the opportunity came up during COVID when we were home during the pandemic to work together. And we decided to write this book so that other children could see themselves in a book and parents could help have a conversation with either their dyslexic child or any child. I love that. You all touched on a lot of great things that I was reflecting on previous episodes that either introducing dyslexic on the show and sharing their journey. I know a colleague and friend of mine talked about how he turned to animation and really drawing and illustrating and very much of what you said, John and Lynn, There was a former superintendent on my show and she had four kids and she knew that there was something not right. And I just love that you all represent so much in the show. And I know that it will resonate with so many people that are listening. So I really appreciate your vulnerability and really, you know, we're talking more about this issue today. And I think that it's good because if we don't talk about it, then we don't know about it. We can't make a difference. And we know that there's still a lot of change that still needs to happen in the American public schools, but we're getting there inch by inch by at least talking about it, like in a space like this. I love that. And so I actually really want to ask you all, I mean, I probably can infer what the answer is, but I want you all to share. So your children's book, Robbie the Dyslexic Taxi and the Airport Adventure. I love it. It was so cute. It just really warmed my heart. What's the inspiration behind the book? Who is it for? And, you know, age group. Share a little bit about that with us. We intended for this to be for younger students, fourth grade and below. The inspiration for Robbie was me. It started out when I was younger, couldn't tell my left from my right. Until my mom 
told me a good solution to that was if you take both of your hands up and put your index and yes, like a football post, right? Yeah, like a football post. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> well, one's your left hand because it makes an L and the L. other is your right hand. And that led to this sort of idea of what if we do a story about a taxi cab that can't get its left and left right. And right. that evolved right. into this story of how would it be able to read the signs if it was dyslexic? And then we mm-hmm. came up with creative solutions like left and right. I love that. And so, Lynn, did you write the book or did you all write it together? So we started that I was going to write it and John was going to illustrate it. But Mm -hmm. as we started to do the work, he's like, you know what? I have a point of view and I want to get that across. So we decided to co-author it because a lot of what we wrote about was John and his feelings. And he wanted that point to get across to anyone reading it, especially to a kid who might be feeling that he was less than, and John absolutely did not want that child or anyone listening to feel less than. He wanted them to feel empowered by reading about the success of this taxi. Right. What I loved about it was there was a warm sense of this taxi was accepted. You know, it wasn't like, oh gosh, it's that taxi doesn't know it's left and right. I mean, it really was talking about the uniqueness of each car and, you know, what they brought to the table. and when it got to the turning point, which I don't want to give anything away, I was like, oh no, how is this going to go? And it was a great ending to that perseverance. And I think that that is definitely, I myself am not dyslexic, but I was a late ADHD or diagnosis in college. And that is a struggle for me still. And so I know that dyslexics and ADHDers, we persevere a lot. There's a lot of resilience there. I just loved that that can open up a vocabulary conversation. You can talk about you know, making those connections with kids in the classroom. And then there's that normalization of the representation. So I just feel like this book is a really great addition to anybody's library, not just teachers, but parents as well. We did a book signing recently and one of the kids came up to us and said, thank you so much for writing this book. I saw myself and, you know, I feel like somebody could see me now and I'm not alone. And it was so heartwarming. And it was exactly the reason why we wrote this book. I truly love that. So, John, I actually want to ask you a question and I want like the before and after, you know, like the makeover. So what does life look like through your dyslexic lens? So what did it look like before you were diagnosed? And I'd love to know if you're comfortable at age you were diagnosed and what does it look like now? I'm not going to lie. It was a very difficult period of time. I was viewed as different and even some teachers looked down upon me. And I was just sort of going through the motions of what's wrong with me. I'm not smart. I'm dumb. It was incredibly difficult. And it wasn't until I got tested, the tester was like clearly dyslexic, that I thought to myself, oh, wait, I'm not dumb. I'm just different. And once that came across, I gained a lot of... He felt so much better about himself. He was relieved. A sense of self. Yes. You know, it's like, it's not my fault. It's just the way my brain works. How old were you, if you don't mind me asking? I was five. He was five when we figured it out and six when we diagnosed him. And, you know, I have found from my experience interviewing a lot of dyslexics that, and I'm curious to know what you think, John, about this and Lynn as well. Some folks will say dyslexia is a gift and some folks will say it's a disability. And so from my vantage point of interviewing, I found that the people who say it's a gift were diagnosed at a very young age. And those who were diagnosed in their teenage adult years call it a disability because it robbed them of the things that they can't really do now or aren't very competent in. So I'm curious to know, how do you view dyslexia? I view it as only a positive thing. Okay. I believe that it's not a disability, it's a difference. Mm -hmm. I see why if you were given the diagnosis later on in your life, it could change how you view yourself. And Mm -hmm. that's really heartbreaking. Therefore, I just feel it's so important to spend the time and the resources towards making sure as few people fall through the gaps as possible. Absolutely. Lynn, what do you think from a mom's perspective? You know, you saw what your son was going through, the youngest of four. Did you view this as a difference, a disability, a gift? 
What are your thoughts around that? I think at the beginning when I knew something was different and nobody would listen to me, they were saying that I did not understand my child when I knew 100% that he was really smart. He was three years old. He could tell you any Thomas the Dank Engine. Right. And, and, but he couldn't tell you Thomas started with a T. Mm-hmm. His memory was amazing. He could remember so many things. And so I knew for a fact that he was a smart kid. And it was very, very frustrating because it was an uphill fight mm-hmm. to get people to say, you know, what do you need? How can we figure this out? And I think it's very difficult for parents. They really have to listen to their child. They have to advocate for their child. And I think it might be hard if the child doesn't get the tools Mm -hmm. that he or she needs to move forward. It's a little bit of a disability, but I think if there's a way to give that child acceptance, it's their superpower. They're creative. Yeah, they're creative and hardworking. And I think it's important for us to help educate the teachers and parents as to what to look for. If you're a tired teacher looking for a way out of the classroom and want to turn your expertise and talents into becoming your boss, creating your flexible schedule, and building a business that serves your needs and wants, then you want to subscribe to my Tired Teacher to Teacherpreneur Mindset Monday episodes. If you want a taste of what it's like to transition out of the classroom to becoming a teacherpreneur, then join me every Monday for 15 minutes. This exclusive subscription offers a community, resources, and access to me all for $5 a month. Put that $5 towards your morning coffee from Starbucks to good use and subscribe today. Click the link in the show notes and hang out with me and other teachers every Monday at 5 a.m. See you there. I agree. And season two of this podcast was actually all about moms sharing their stories and exactly what you said, uphill battles, hard. People are saying, you know, they weren't listening to you. That's the common theme here. And this is why this podcast exists. It's a free resource for anybody who is questioning or in this journey or needs resources to tune in. So I just think that this is great that we are, you know, again, talking about this. So John, what does dyslexia look like now after you've been, as you said, remediated? How do you view the world now? I view the world through a lens that I believe is unique to people with dyslexia, that yes, we're different. And perhaps we may have trouble with certain things that other people would take for granted. But at the same time, we can come up with some really amazing solutions to problems. And there are so many important and powerful people out there that have dyslexia who have used it to their advantage. And I feel it is perfect to use this lens, not in a way of negativity, but positivity. I absolutely agree. I want to touch on something that I know has been impacting so many teachers and so many students. And I know that the podcast Sold a Story really came from COVID and from parents sitting there going to school virtually with their kindergarten or first grade saying, what is my child learning? They are not reading. And so there's this, there's always been that science of reading war, balanced literacy war, all of that. But it seemed like COVID was the thing that just brought everything to a head, even though it was kind of there, but maybe we didn't want to address it. And we know that our reading scores in this country are subpar. I mean, we do not have kids that are passing and it could be because they weren't explicitly taught or because they're dyslexic and teachers just don't know how to identify, don't know what to do and are just passing them along. So from your perspective, living through COVID and being dyslexic, how has that changed your view on dyslexia, if any? For COVID in this respect, I almost view it as, I guess, one of the best things that come out of this is this story that we created. Mm, Okay. However, I also know that for a lot of young children, they were separated from classes and teachers who may have known what to look for. So I think now, especially, it is important to be on lookout for anyone who shows any signs of these learning differences Mm -hmm. because it was so easy for them to fall through and be missed when they were stuck at home. 
Right. Lynn, what are your thoughts given what COVID has done <laughs> in so many ways? There's so much to unpack there. I know, I know. Oh my gosh. So, but I do feel really that for John was home from college and he was a studio art major. Mm, okay. and we, we can't do art virtually. Yes. Oh, so, wow. Yes. <laughs> right. So that <laughs> sort of like, okay, so how can John sort of spend his time more productively? And we had always talked about writing a book and mm -hmm. we started discussing how would this book look and maybe this would be a great time to do it. And oh yeah, Taxi, who has to navigate the world and can't read, how is he or she going to do that? And we started coming up with a whole plan and we decided that this way we could reach so many of the kids who feel like they're falling through the cracks and the parents sort of make them aware of maybe signs in their children, what to look for and what to maybe start thinking about how they can advocate for their children. Because I think even though the conversation has grown in this country, it's really not where it needs to be because teachers who teach learning differences, there's a huge amount that goes under that category. You know, unfortunately, not every teacher who tries to teach a learning child with a learning disability or a difference doesn't know really how to teach each one in the best way possible or how to even find that child. So I think it's important to really be able to advocate for your children. And we were hoping that this conversation, this book would be a way for people to start that road. Well, and you know, to touch on the teacher comment, I have two thoughts around that. So I don't ever remember hearing the word dyslexia ever in my grad school programs. And I was in elementary, I have a dual master's in elementary ed and special ed. So that was never a word I heard. <laughs> and, yeah. and I remember being in a reading methods class and dyslexia didn't cross my mind, but I was like, well, what about these struggling readers? Like, what do we do? In retrospect, it was a lot of create a learning environment where kids love to read. And I always would ask like, but how are we teaching them how to read? Do we just hand them a book and say, you're supposed right. to enjoy this? But it wasn't until my very first full-time job interview was at a specialized private dyslexic school. And I kid you not, and I talked about this story in episode one to kind of give context as to who I am, but I did not think I was going to get hired. I was like, I don't know anything about dyslexia. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I can't help these kids. I don't know. But because I started off with the Orton Gillingham methodology and trained with a fellow and I had real world hands-on experience with multi-sensory approach, curriculum, all that, and a plethora of like teachers that were in the same world that I was in. So if I was struggling with understanding how to create a lesson for this child, I could go across the hall and say, how can you help me? They're still struggling with this sound or what do I do here? And so I think there's definitely a crisis in our college and university school system with educating teachers. And that's exactly, you know, why you're saying parents need to educate yes. themselves yes. because you unfortunately can't always look to the teacher. Now, I know we're trying to change that and get some dyslexia certifications and things of that nature in our universities and colleges, but taking a five-hour course is not going to make a massive difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's hard. And then with special ed, we are not specialized doctors. Like, Doctors go to medical school, but then if they want to specialize, they go into another specialty. Well, with special ed, so am I supposed to know how to work with kids with, who are medically fragile versus autistic kids versus dyslexic kids? So, I mean, special ed is a wide range as well, and it's a tall order. So I just feel like the whole system is just not working. <laughs> so, yes, I feel like it's a little bit broken because... They certainly have every intention to do good in the world, but right. you cannot. Orton Gillingham, when John was taught through that method, the teachers had to spend years mm -hmm. learning the method to teach these kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you go to school for that, unless you're going specifically for a specific kind of learning difference, learning disability, you're not going to get everything you need. And I think it's really important because I had so many teachers and granted it was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but I had so many teachers say to me, I don't get it. He's smart. Why can't he read? Or right. you know, not understanding what dyslexic was. So Lynn, from your perspective as the mom, what advice can you give other moms who are struggling, whether they're early in the stages or further down the line, what advice can you give them? 
I think it's very important to start by educating yourself. Listen to Mm -hmm. your child, listen to what he or she is saying, what's going on, educate yourself. There's so many books and resources and this podcast. Yes. And, you know, you really have to start understanding because it's really important to be able to advocate for your child. Each school district is different. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a parent needs to be armed with the right language to ask for what they think their child needs. I agree with that 100%. I actually have an episode called How to Start the D-Cube Conversation. Now, I don't know if you all know, but I call dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia D-Cubed. I think it's like the, the funny teacher in me. I had to make a math joke out of it. But yes, I think a lot of parents don't know what to ask and they just are leading with their emotions, which is rightfully so understood. But we need to be equipped to go in, as you said, armed to go in to know what to say, how to advocate, bring suggestions to the table. So I think that's a great piece of advice to share. I remember when I was fully diagnosed, you could often find mom somewhere in the house looking through one of the books that would, including some Norton Gillingham information, just trying to figure out what was the best thing she could do. And honestly, just knowing that the family and she were in my corner automatically is such a uplifting feeling and made me feel like I had every chance to succeed because I had all these people who were putting so much time and effort into figuring this out with me. Yeah, that support is huge. And I think that is probably the easiest step that we could start, you know, as long as we can really support our child. And even if you're like, I have no idea what's going on, but you can say, we're going to get through this together. Yes. You know, I think that goes a long way for yeah. really, really both, because it could be an affirmation for the parents too, because you're probably thinking, I don't know what's going on, but we're going to get through this. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, it's so important. Yes, yes. So Lynn and John, we are coming to the end of our episode and I really want to be able to give you all the opportunity to let people know where can they find this book and how can they reach you if they want to chat a little bit further? You can find the book on pretty much any seller. You can find it on Amazon, bookshop.org. Barnes and Noble. Okay. Absolutely. Almost any book retailer, you can find it online. I mean, if you go into a bookstore and ask for it, they have the ability to order it. Okay. And also we have a website, robbythetaxi.com, and people can go and look at that. There's a contact us. We are so happy to have a conversation with anybody so they can reach out that way. And we're on social media, robbythetaxi.com, mm-hmm. and happy to talk to anybody who wants to pick our brain, whatever that means. So (laughs) sure. For those of you who are driving or working out, as I always say, those links are in the show notes. So be sure to click that either, you know, when you're done with whatever you're doing or click it now to kind of look at it, but definitely reach out to Lynn and John and go get this book because it is a great book. I love the visuals. I love the flow of the book. It's really cute. And I think the representation is just so needed and so necessary. And there are more dyslexic books out there, not just about educating parents, but I mean, really having kids saying like, oh, I see myself in that. Thank you so much. We really hope people like the book. We put our heart and soul into it. And I think that if it's read by the parents and the children, they will see themselves and it opens up so many different conversations. So thank you so much. Thank you for giving us this platform. Absolutely. Well, It was a pleasure chatting with you all and for everyone else, stay tuned for next week's episode. 